I know you just sat down. I'm going to ask you to stand. <laughs> if you would, open in your Bibles uh, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are in part 2 of this message in our future series. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading through verses 1 to 12. And I'll read the odd-numbered verses. You guys know the drill. If you'll read the even-numbered verses out of the New King James Version Bible. And uh, we're looking at this message. It, it's an ongoing, I say ongoing, we covered it, or I should say started it last week. We'll be in it today as, as well in our future series. And that is after the saints go marching in. And I am deliberately, as you know, building upon each week regarding what the Bible says uh, concerning eschatology or the future doctrines or future events of the Bible. If you're visiting for the first time, you should know that this is a deliberate thing that I'm doing. Uh, it is necessary that we, as a constantly growing church, that we keep our focus on where our focus needs to be. And you'll hear about that today. There'll be a little bit of a recap from last week, which is part one. Today's part two. And we'll see uh, if we need to continue on in this particular title, After the Saints Go Marching In, which is a reference regarding the rapture of the church. And from there, we're, we're moving on. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. I'll begin if you would pick it up in verse 2 out loud. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you... Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, verse 5, do you not remember that when I was Still with you, I told you these things. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, it's the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And for this reason, that reason is verse 10, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you would continue to stir our hearts to the truth. Lord, I know that traditionally we're in a building right now. We're glad for that. It's warm in here. We're glad for that. Everything looks kind of church normal-like. And I guess in some degree we're glad for that. But Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would actually possess this gathering that you'd possess us, that there would be nothing predictable or traditional about our gathering today, but it would be an assemblage of your people, the church in the 21st century, and God, that each and every one of us are here because we have determined not to play church, we have determined not to pretend, we have determined not to do what you're supposed to do on Sundays, but God, we have come here today starving, as it were, to hear your spirit speak to us. And Lord, we pray that you would energize us, God, that we would leave this building today transformed people. May this not be just another Sunday, but Lord, as the days lessen and we get closer to your return, may this day be a day that we can look back and say that the Lord was in this place. So Father God, move, we pray, move in our hearts, move in our midst. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, 
Amen. Hey, before you sit down, can you hold up your Bible, even if it's on your smart device, hold it up? Okay. That is an awesome sight. I want you to carefully bring it down. Gently. You can be seated. Don't cut yourself with it. <laughs> By that, let me say, the Word of God, the Bible says, is living and powerful. It's just not some book you just held up a moment ago. It's living and powerful. Hebrews 4, 12 says, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division and the soul of the spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. There is no creature hidden from its sight, from his sight. He is the word. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The Bible. The Bible you just held up a moment ago. Uh, yeah, it looks like a book. But according to the Bible itself, that it has the ability to dive into the very thoughts and the motives of your heart and mind, and it's able to dissect you, dissect me. God's incredible truth, awesome truth. And as we are looking at these prophetic themes of the Bible, we need to remember that to qualify the accuracy or the authority of the Bible, God has not left us on our own. Church family, listen up. You and I have never been called to defend the Bible. Did you know that? By the way, we're not even called to defend our God. There are a lot of religions out there that they have to defend their God. If you say something about their God, they're going to cut your head off. If you say something about their book, they're going to burn down your country. If you say something about... Do you get the drift? The Bible doesn't call Christians to do any of that. You want to know why? He doesn't need our help. He is God. This is his word. It's unfailing. It's true. It's perfect. And God is God with or without us. We don't make him up and then follow him. No, the fact is he has always been and he's invited us to follow him. And how do we know that in a day-to-day -day life in which you and I live in? Well, the standalone authority of the Bible is truly unequaled in all of the world's writings and sacred writ. What is awesome about the Bible is that the Bible in black and white, challenges you to know if it's true or not, to, to discover, to put it to the test, for you to decide. As Christians, we're just to present it. So you take out the word of God, and you don't have to prop it up. You take out the word of God. You held it up a moment ago, and you let it go. You let it go through witness, through preaching, through teaching God's word. It's amazing. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before, that is beforehand, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That is God's writing of future events written down of old is to bring you and I comfort and hope. How does that work? 66 books make up the Bible, penned by 40 different authors over a 1,600-year period of time on several different continents, most of the authors have, having never met one another, all spoke about one key individual. And that revelation, by the way, this is pretty awesome. You can take any one of the 66 books and they stand alone one by one on presenting characteristics and attributes about the Messiah, his name, what he would do, where he would be born, how he would die, how he would live again. It's all written down in the Old Testament scriptures. It's remarkable. And of course, confirmed in the new. There's this perfect harmony that the Bible has from Genesis to Revelation about God's authority revealed in his word. Shouldn't surprise us. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's what the Bible says about itself. Isn't that awesome? Boy, that's the problem, Pastor. That's what the Bible says about itself. What's your problem with that? 
It would carry no value if I said it. It would carry no value if Billy Graham or the Pope said it. In fact, Paul the Apostle said, don't listen to a word I say, didn't he? Acts 17, 11. Write that down. It's not in your notes. It just popped into my head right there. <laughs> Acts 17, 11, Paul said, you search the scriptures and see if what I'm telling you is true. Judge, Paul is saying, my sermons, judge my doctrine, judge my teaching against the Bible. So when the Bible says of itself, it is the inspired word of God, it's like begging you to come and take it on. Test and see. And you can do that. This is one of the tips on how you can do that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter 1, 16 says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received... Or for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. You'll know what that is in a moment. He quotes, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember when that happened? Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration alone with Jesus, Mount Hormon in Israel today. And the Bible tells us that the Lord descended and showed his son Jesus through Moses and Elijah how Christ would die and to encourage or strengthen him in that. And that's when Peter, it's awesome, Peter looks up, James and John, they look up and they see Jesus glowing bright white as Moses and Elijah spoke to him. And the Bible says, and Peter answered and said, which is fantastic, because nobody asked Peter a thing. He wasn't even involved in it. But this is Peter, that's why we love him. Peter answered and said, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tents. You, one for you, Jesus, one for Moses and Elijah. It's a very cute response by Peter, but it was completely out of context. He saw the excellent glory when Christ was transfigured. And that statement there in 2 Peter goes on. Verse 18 says, And we heard this voice which came from heaven we were with him on the holy mountain. And so, verse 19 says, we have the prophetic word confirmed. Verse 20, knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture, no revelation of the Bible, that Bible you held up a moment ago. Listen, there's no giving of it that is of private interpretation. This is awesome. That's why every cult, before they knock on your door, has failed. Because they have taken the revealed word of God and they go, to, go about to contradict what God has revealed to you. God has spoken the truth. And you can study it and research it. It's of no private interpretation. What does that mean today when people say something like this? Well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I see it this way. <clears throat> private interpretation. Well, I know the Bible says this, but I feel... <clears throat> private interpretation. Private interpretation. I know the Bible says this, but I was listening to a pastor or a guy on the radio or some speaker, and he said what it really means is eh, <laughs> private interpretation. Can't do that. Bible is to interpret Bible. It's up to us to agree with it. Verse 21 of 2 Peter Chapter 1 says, verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved. That uh, Greek word means wrapped in wind, or it means to be uh, wind-driven, or borne aloft. I love that, to be borne aloft. The wind picked them up and carried them. Now, the wind didn't pick them up and carry them. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrapped them up. And reveal to them the word of God. It wasn't on their own strength. It wasn't on their own power. God revealed the Bible. And there, and there the scripture says that it was by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the author of the scriptures. And so this is why 2,000 years ago Jesus held Israel accountable to know the prophetic Bible. And listen, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't say this to scare you. I, I say this to prepare you. God expects you and I right now to know the prophetic doctrines of the Bible. There's no excuse. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, it's Palm Sunday morning, 2,000 years ago. 
Jesus is riding on the back of the donkey, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And as he rides into Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives is to his back. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, this is his first coming now. Remember, he's coming to be uh, received as king for that week prior to his crucifixion. The one who, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Isn't it interesting that Jesus just said right then and there that he's the one throughout all of his, Israel's existence who had sent the prophets to them, the eternal son of God. I sent the prophets to you. Jesus says, but you are not willing. You weren't interested. Verse 38, see or behold, your house has left you desolate. Jesus motions to the temple. So I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, now this is the second coming. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The next time Jesus comes back in the second coming, Israel will be shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Did you know that? And in between those comings, the first coming and the second coming, is you. Us, the church age. And we are nearing the end, by the way. It's been 2,000 years as we approach now the end of the church age. And we studied last time together regarding some of those aspects. But as we look at this message, after the saints go marching in, this is what we remember. It's this. We learn that there is left behind a world in free fall. That when the church is raptured out of this world to meet Christ, again, look at our first study later, the world is left into a, a condition where the Holy Spirit, friends, you read it a moment ago, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the earth, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. Right now, the Holy Spirit is working in the earth through the church and every believer to stand against evil. By the way, I need to ask myself, as the Holy Spirit possesses my life, am I a Christian standing against evil? The Holy Spirit resists evil in this world at this time through the believers. It's not our strength, it's his strength. It's not our presence, it's his presence. But when the church is deposited into the arms of Jesus at the rapture, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the earth. The Holy Spirit stands aside or he gets out of the way. He's, he's removed out of the way. He doesn't leave. He steps aside. And when that happens, evil is going to go breakneck crazy. In a post-rapture world, that's what we learned. We learned about a post-rapture world. We learned that also that there is left behind this great cry by the world for peace and safety. Read about that. We read about Daniel's prophecy, chapter 8, verse 25, where the one that is coming, called the Antichrist, will deceive the world and answer their cry for peace and prosperity with his policies to bring peace to the Middle East and to sign a seven, seven year contract with the nation of Israel and its surrounding neighbors, the Bible says. And then. Thirdly, this is where we left off church last time. Thirdly, there's going to be left behind a global economic, remember I used this word? Reset. And, and we ended the message by using the word reset and, and telling you to come on back, we'll study more about it, and here we are today, and here's the deal. Uh, so many of us have been conditioned to think that reset is a modern day term, it's a, it's a cool uh, global word now, reset, reset, everybody's talking about reset, we need to reset politics, we need to reset the economy, we need to, re we need to go back and reset, we need to reset the company. That's an ancient word. People think it's, it's fairly new. No, it's not fairly new. It's ancient. There's going to be a global reset. And some of these things, church, because I intentionally got ahead of myself last week to answer up, to bundle up or tie up the end, some of these things you'll recognize from last week. A global economic reset, according to the Bible, has to come just after the rapture of the church. Did you hear me? Okay, I need you to participate. You want to just sit down for You want to just wait? We'll get some coffee, get, some, get an IV drip of... 
Coffee there going? This is very important because, listen, if you're, not a, if, if you're not a real true believer in Jesus Christ, this could cost you your life forever and ever if you miss this. At some moment, there's going to be a, a, an instantaneous vanishing of the Christian. And in that, yes, woo, yeah. <laughs> and in that, there you are, in that moment, in that moment, it may not be detected instantly, but after the rapture happens, what may not be detected instantly, but it certainly opens the floodgates of evil, there's going to be a bizarro manifestation of spiritual deception on the earth. I actually believe that the rapture will be explained away by satanic lies. And the world is going to be plunged headlong into a free fall. First thing I want you to see is a few slides here. The first slide, you guys, I want you to take a look at this. The Great Reset. I didn't make this up. We didn't make this, by the way. This is from the World Economic Forum. There's an urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. I could go on forever right now to show you and talk to you about how important it is to the World Economic Forum to keep the COVID-19 issue alive as long as they can milk it. They need it. And if it dies, if it dies, they're going to find another one. I promise you this. I hate to blow your mind so early in the morning, but there will never be the normal that you used to know. These guys and a host of others will not allow it. How can you say that? Because the Bible says there's a coming economic reset. And when the world tells us they are working on a global economic reset, no wonder why I had you hold up your Bible. And so, taking place in the context of the United Nations General Assembly, farce, the World Economic Forum's fourth and, for the first time, fully virtual, sustainable, and it goes on to talk about how we bring the world together as one economically to press reset, making nations equal. Think of it. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Listen, it sounds great. It sounds great. Listen, let's be honest. Socialism works perfect if everybody in it is perfect. That's why it's never worked. Socialism is a fancy statement for a couple of power brokers to dupe people into thinking they've got everything in common and they'll give you some vodka and some cheese and some bread while they live like cosmic kings. And it's been the same throughout all of human history because why? The human heart is corrupt. But my, but my millennial told me we're going to do it right this time. <laughs> how can you take counsel from someone who has not learned yet how to make their bed <laughs> or make a credit card payment? The Great Reset. I love millennials. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I love them. In fact, we have great millennials walking around this campus, thank God. If this nation had our millennials, this nation would be a different place today. But there's a global economic reset coming. The next slide. Check this out. Next one. Hitting the reset button to avoid a new Great Depression. This is from Forbes magazine. See that? I'm not making it up. And I'm going to give you a Bible here in a second to show you what undergirds this movement. Third slide. Global economic reset promoting a more inclusive recovery. The COVID-19 crisis is inflicting the most pain on those who are already most vulnerable. Well, I could fix that today. Why don't they ask me? You want to fix this? Open up your business. That first sentence goes right down the tubes. Never in the history of man has sickness made it into a culture and that culture shuts itself down. Did you know that's like getting a cut, going to the doctor and then having them take a chainsaw to the cut? You don't do that. But when you're at the end of the world, as we know it, 
This not only happened in America, it happened everywhere at once. Don't tell me we're not near the end. Look up, friends. Any day now, this calamity could lead to a significant rise in income inequality. Yes. Yes, when you have a policy of you're essential and you're not essential. Translation, inequality. Do you hear me? Oh, is this making too much sense? Oh, there's so much inequality. Hey, why don't you just get off of your political microphone and go sit on your throne and let people work and let them do what they have been called to do and you won't have inequality. And this is a fact. It's a fact. It was once something that happened for hundreds and hundreds of years in what was once called the United States of America. And it could jeopardize development gains from educational attainment to poverty reduction. The new estimates suggest that up to 100 million people worldwide could be pushed into extreme poverty. That's a fact. That's exactly what's happening right now. And some of it is happening in your community. Erasing all gains made in poverty reduction in the past three years. No wonder why the Bible says this man, the Antichrist, will come on the world scene with a team pressing a reset button to relieve people from this man-made mismanagement or maybe man-made stroke of demonic genius to gain control. Remarkable. Revelation 13, verse 16, regarding the tribulation period, there'll be this man who comes on the scene. It says that he will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. We used to think that was weird. And I've always explained it away, and I still do, by the way, that we're too vain, or humanity, we're not going to be here. The church will be gone when this happens. But humanity, humans, humans are too vain to have a mark on their forehead. I mean, I'm thinking they just cover it up with makeup or something. Or on their right hand. I get the right hand. Tattoo, number, something. I get that. But on your face? The Bible says there's going to be a day when people are going to receive, they'll have an option. You want, hi, you want it on your forehead? Or do you want it on your right hand? I find that fascinating. Maybe it's going to be, what's the word, sub, subcutaneous? Subcutaneous, where it's underneath the skin. You know, Israel has now the no more the barcode on stuff. They have a chip. They have a chip that is so small, it's woven into fabric itself. You can't even see it. You can't even detect it. And uh, they put it on terrorists, by the way. They'll, they'll arrest a terrorist. And um, they'll, they'll sew it into his beanie or in his robe. They'll interrogate him and then turn him loose. And the guy goes home. And they track him on a satellite all the way home. Uh, they can pick up an Israeli fiber, uh, I mean, I mean a, a piece of clothing, a book, or, or, or a part. And uh, that, th- that little micro, super microscopic thing is built in. It used to be have all the data of a barcode is now reduced down to a quarter of a grain of sand. They could put that in you. I don't know. But look at Revelation. Keep going. Revelation 13, 17. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the number uh, or the name of the beast, excuse me, or the number of his name. And we know if you keep reading that chapter, it says that his number of his name is 666. By the way, in Jewish thinking, in the Hebrew mind, 666 in uh, numerology is man making himself to be a god. Man declares himself God. 666. That's what that stands for. And it'd be some sort of a prefix number. You won't be duped into it, by the way. Don't ask me after service. If I get the vaccination, am I going to be accepting the mark of the beast? No, you won't. You're going to have to willfully accept the mark. And by the way, if you're a Christian today, you won't even be here. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian today, you should become one. And if you don't become one, then do you want it on your right hand or your forehead? Because you're going to be sent a lie. And you won't be able to believe. Because it says there in 2 Thessalonians, deception is going to be sent by God to those who had a chance. Woo! Man, that's serious. 
But we say, man, that's ridiculous. You really believe that? Yeah, I do. The Bible hasn't been wrong yet. You can bank on it being right. But it seems kind of outlandish. So I want to give to you 1 Californians chapter 1, <laughs> verse 16. 1 Californians 1. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mask <laughs> on their face or a plastic shield on their foreheads. <laughs> now, well, I'm joking about that. If you have to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you're compromised, or wear a mask. But I'm, listen, here's the point. Verse 17, and no one may buy or sell except one who has the mask or a uh, mask on their face. You say, whew, I thought, it's a good thing you're joking there. Oh, well, I am joking. There is no first Californians. But isn't it amazing? How many, how many of us have been asked to step out of a store? And we, excuse me, sir, put your mask on or, uh, or get out. See you. Right? You can't. Now, now, okay, now I'm officially exaggerating. Are you ready? What if somebody said, you can't buy or sell unless you have a mask? You say, that's silly. It is silly, but it's conditioning. We mentioned that last week. It's just getting people used to someone else being in control. And this is, and this is the last thing I showed you last week, I think. Last slide here. Remember, Satan moves in increments. In Israel... Regarding the vaccination, you are not going to be able to go around Israel, as I mentioned to you last week. In Israel, when they get the vaccine, that's uh, going to be out momentarily. By the way, I guess ours, you know, is coming out any week, any day now. Uh, it's this week or next week. So here's the thing. In Israel, if you get the vaccination, you get, a, you get identification. And if you have the vaccination, you get to go to the entire nation as you always have. You can go anywhere you want. You get, a green, you get a green pass. If you don't take the vaccination, you get a yellow pass, and you cannot go to all areas of Israel. Think of it. What if, listen, what if we want to take a vacation? What if we want to take a, a church cruise to Alaska, Alaska Bible cruise, amazing God's creation? Oh, we have a problem. We have a problem because we stop in Canada. And what if Canada won't let you off the boat without the paperwork of having a shot? Control. You see, all of a sudden, a global reset and a world economic decision that this is how we're going to buy and sell. This is how we're going to reset the economies. We're going to do this. Nobody's going to be able to buy or sell unless they have this number. And that number is going to indicate that you've sworn allegiance to the policies of the one warned about in Daniel 8, 25, that this one will come. This world leader will arise out of a crisis and he's going to have all of the answers and what he says goes. And the world will love him. Number two, there is left behind a God in the making, this Antichrist. And mark it down, he's Satan's man who's in the shadows right now. I believe that the man, I, it's my opinion, that he's alive somewhere today. And that's not as far stretch. And you guys, you know I'm repeating myself from last time, that S Satan has always had to have an Antichrist in his pocket. Because Satan doesn't know when God is going to rapture the church. So when the church is gone, then the end time scenario begins. So in every generation, think of it, Satan has had to have a man in the wings waiting. And uh, kind of gave you a little, you know, creepy feeling when I, I mentioned to you that, think about it, right now, somewhere in the world, Satan's probably got two, three, four, five guys that he has in his pocket, and they're in waiting just in case. Can you imagine... I bet you Satan is like this every day regarding the rapture. <laughs> there's, a, there's a horn honk in New York City, and he's like. Because <laughs> the Bible tells us you and I are supposed to be constantly watching, waiting, and ready. It's a big trigger. And this man that's in the shadows, the Bible calls him the son of perdition, he will be revealed. 
remarkable. In 2 Thessalonians, the church was troubled because they were being told by false teachers that not only had they missed their rapture, but they were right in the middle of the end times and Christ would be coming back momentarily to establish his kingdom. They, they, the false teachers had completely removed the millennial reign and they had removed the church age. In verse 2 it says, don't be soon shaken or not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. Number one, that day will not come unless the departing from faith happens. Apostasy. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. He's going to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God, hang on, in the temple of God. You need Jerusalem for that. You need Jews in control of Israel and Jerusalem for that to happen. And he's going to show himself that he is God. Those of you who are young enough, you've always known your map and globe to have Israel on your map. Now, I am too, by the way. I was born in 58, 1958. But in 1948, on May 14th, in one day, never before in human history, Israel became a nation a second time. Isaiah said, shall a nation be brought forth in a day? Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that pro uh, one of those prophetic clocks started ticking regarding the end times. And then, remember you guys, those of, those of us who are a little bit older now, I think I was about nine years old-ish, ten-ish, when there was a big battle. And the Jews took control of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years. You should say, wow! That's, listen, in 2,000 years they had no control. But the Bible says, in many places, on many various topics... The Jews have got to be back in the land before Christ establishes his second coming, coming to his throne. They've got to be in control of Jerusalem when that happens. And in 1967, Israel, first time in 2,000 years, took control of Jerusalem. Yeah, that's amazing. So, another clock started ticking, as it were. And here you read in a 2,000-year-old document that's open on your lap, that this guy, this, this son of perdition, Antichrist, he's going to stand in the temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. This is for your research later. Go research the many, many websites of how Israel is ready today to start rebuilding the temple. Today. Go to the templemountinstitute.org. Take a look. Church, all these things are for us to get ready and to be evangelists and to be lovers of men's souls and to be disciples and followers of Jesus and to be looking up the whole time. Matthew 24, verse 15. Jesus talked about this. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, isn't it amazing, church? Jesus expects his people to know the book of Daniel. Question, don't answer out loud. Do you know the book of Daniel? It's the holy of holies of Bible prophecy, the book of Daniel. You'll never understand the book of Revelation unless you read the book of Daniel. So the question is, how you should ask yourself, how well do I know the book of Daniel and start studying it today? We'll cover many of it and much of it in our series here, but you need to read it. That warning by Daniel, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And here we go, Daniel 12, verse 11. From the time the daily sacrifice is stopped, let me explain that. According to the Bible, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to tell the priest, get out of the way. And he's going to desecrate the temple. 
I wonder how many uh, eschatologists are in this room right now. The Bible tells you exactly the day he'll do it. Did you know that? The day. On the 1,260th day, the book of Daniel tells us, from the Antichrist signing a seven-year contract with Israel, are you listening? There's 360 days in the Bible calendar, not 365. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is based on a 360-day calendar. There is no 365 calendar in the Bible. 1,260 days, which is a biblical three and a half years, from the day the peace treaty is signed, 1,260 days from that day, he's going to go into the temple and he's going to go on CNN and Fox and all the cable and all the satellite networks and the Bible says the world will see this and he will declare himself to be God. And you know what the world does? The world goes, right on. You're awesome. And the Bible says, Jesus says in Matthew 24 to the Jews, the moment you see that happen, run. Don't even go downstairs to get your coat. Run. Wow. In the midpoint, he will go into the temple and declare himself to be God. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no temple in Jerusalem right now, but they're talking about building it. I'm looking up. I'm excited. So from the time the daily sacrifice is stopped, that's where he interrupts with himself, and the sacrilegious object that causes desecration is set up to be worshipped, there will be 1,290 days. The 30 days added are explained in Daniel 12 in greater detail. 1260, 1260, there's an added 30. And then, listen, there's, as you read Daniel 12, and we'll mention to you the 1,235th day. Everything is coded there in Daniel, but it's all based upon the signing of the seven-year contract, which has everything to do with God and his people, Israel, and not you. That's why you can't find the church anywhere in the tribulation period. You should get excited about that. That's pretty awesome. The next thing is that there's going to be left behind the preparation of the, gospel, uh, of the nations. The preparation of the nations. Uh, there's going to be a manifestation. And again, I showed you this last time where the world's going to look around. And what, what ca- causes four predominant leaders? The Bible tells us both in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel that there's going to be four leaders that will arise out of a conglomeration of leaders. So it kind of goes like this. Have you ever looked at like the photograph of like the G, you know, the G10 or the G20? Anybody familiar with that? Where it's the global nations that make, uh, they, they're the movers and the shakers. The, the big 10 or the big 20 nations of the world that set policy predominantly about uh, economics. There's, there's oh, you, you, you can look at every picture since they've been doing this. But have you, you ever noticed that right in the middle, they always line the guys up, and they always put the guys right in the middle where it's all riding on. So there'll be the United States, there'll be Germany, there'll be England, and sometimes they throw in Russia as a courtesy, to be honest with you, because Putin was so upset that he didn't get to stand there. But it's always the big brokers. The Bible says out of that group that will arise, there'll be four that will be in the middle of the picture. And the Bible says one of them, who is the least significant of them, he's not such a big deal. He would be like uh, Macron today. I'm not saying, I am not saying <laughs> Macron's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be brilliant. The Antichrist is going to be articulate. The Antichrist is going to be something. But... This guy, he's going to rise up and he's going to have these demonic powers come upon him where he'll be able to speak and people will not be able to refute what he says. They're going to be like, oh my goodness, that was brilliant. He's probably going to be surprised himself with what he says. And the Bible says Satan will enter him. Wow. Do you guys want me to show you that quote from last week or did I not show you? Let's, Let's look at it again. 
Let's go ahead. Remember that one? Former Belgian Prime Minister of the Founding Fathers of the European Union. Quote, we do not want another committee. We do not, uh, we've had, we have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold allegiance of all people and to lift us out of this economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. And that is true. <laughs> That's going to happen. Remarkable. Remarkable statement. Satan knows this well, and he knows how we're designed, and we know that we've got to have a leader. Whatever God gives church, Satan prostitutes and pimps it. You know that. God gives government, man creates politics. God gives sex, and man turns it into pornography. God gives marriage, and man redefines it. God gives life, man aborts it. God creates the universe to display his glory. Man says, we evolved. God says he's God, and man says, no, you're not. I'm God. We are one messed up lot. That's in man's heart. I want to read something to you. I think you can follow along. 1971, everybody went nuts over this. They still do. They play it in Europe a lot. It makes me kind of sick, actually. John Lennon's Imagine. This one worldism is Satan's answer to a churchless, Christless age that's coming. So let me read it to you. I don't know if you guys, oh yeah, okay. Imagine there's no heaven. What? Why? How about this? Imagine there's no heaven because uh, you're, if you're John Lennon writing this, you're writing to the globalist and you're thinking, imagine there's no heaven because we're not, we're not willing to go there the way Jesus said. So let's just get away with let's just uh, let's just get away from heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today, and you know the uh -huh part. <laughs> Imagine there's no countries. Let's do away with borders, says the world globalist. No more borders. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You hoo <laughs> You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions, says, <laughs> says the billionaire. Or <laughs> Nobody possessing anything except me. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Wow. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Wow. You know who would say amen to that song? She already did. AOC. Now, you might, you might say, Pastor Jack, this is getting really political. No, it's not. It's getting really biblical. This is what the Bible says about what's coming, and the world is going to be as one. And that strikes a nerve. It strikes a nerve in people. That's a little too close to home. Listen, time is arriving to the ancient prophecies of the Bible that just stand there. They're just waiting. And here come, here we are on a, on a train. Boop, boop. Pulling up. What's this one? Rapture of the church. Oh, what's the next one? Advent of the Antichrist and a world in free fall. What's the next one? Global economy. Are you hearing me? Yeah. This is what the Bible has always said. And now we think it's too fantastic because it's so us. Which means he's near. Jesus is near. He's coming. Are you ready for him? Revelation 17, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, these are judgments, came and talked with me saying, come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, 
with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And again, you read the book of Daniel, you know exactly who this is now. Seven heads and ten horns. This beast, and this woman rides the beast? By the way, if I forget, because I have ADD really bad, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> when I get done reading this, remind me to mention to you the Greek gyro. Okay? Not the one you eat. <laughs> Verse 4 the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. This is obviously a religious system that has its origins in ancient Babylonianism, but she is the religion of the world at whatever time Revelation 17 is speaking about. John says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Guess who kills the saints during the tribulation period? The Antichrist doesn't come off of his office meetings and Zoom calls and go, he doesn't go kill Christians. No, it's the religious hierarchy, the, the queen, this woman riding the beast. The beast, the Antichrist is referred to as the beast. She's, riding, she's on him. She's religion. She attacks the tribulation saints. Daniel 9.27 tells us, Daniel 7.21, excuse me, tells us that power will be given to this Antichrist system to kill God's people on earth. Wow. And so he saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. There you go. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Isn't that great how the Bible tells you what the symbol meant? <laughs> so great. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purposes, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Verse 18, and the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. She will represent religion. Remarkable. Global economy, global religion in the last days, qualifying the saints, the martyrs of Jesus will be targeted. Right now, as I've mentioned before, the church, you and I, are to live for Christ. Those in the tribulation period will be called to die for Christ. Number three, I don't know, we're going we're gonna to push, right? We're just going to go? We're almost there? Thank you. See how... When you get a chance, don't do it now. Just write yourself a note. Go look at the backside. Go look at the, year, the, the euro coin from Greece. The euro, one euro coin from the nation of Greece. Go look at it. When you flip it around, there is a woman robed riding on the back of a beast over the waters. Think I'm kidding? I should have brought you a picture. You say, what is that? What is that? Every European will say, calm down. We know what that is. The waters are the nations of the world. How do we know? Because the weird beast that she's riding, that's Zeus. That's his story. He's going to conquer the worlds. That's why he's running over the water. Notice he's not in the water. He's running over the water. And the woman on the back, calm down, you Christians. That's Europa. Europa rides him to conquer the world. Listen, the last governing world empire 
was never defeated. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, it's going to come back. For example, Babylonian Empire, was that defeated? Yep. Was the Medo-Persian Empire that followed defeated? Yep. Was the Grecian Empire that followed it defeated? Yep. Then who defeated the Grecian Empire? The Roman Empire. Who defeated the Roman Empire? No one. It's never ended. It just got so big, it broke up. People just stopped paying attention to it. Seriously. The, the Roman Empire has never been defeated. The Bible tells us in the last days, that ancient world, that ancient governing power will be brought back together, no longer represented in Daniel's statue of the, of the east and the west legs or eastern, western Roman Empire. It doesn't say, no, the legs are going to come back together. No, it says out of the legs will be formed ten toes. And out of the ten toes, four will arise, and out of the four, three will be, and one will conquer them and become this one we call the son of perdition, the Antichrist. No one's defeated the Roman Empire. Third, there is left behind a great deception, obviously. 1 John 5, 19 says, for we know that we are of God, listen, friend, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, Satan. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, his leash has gotten longer. All of a sudden, Satan is loose. This whole world is under the sway of Satan. The advent of violence and evil around the world, anarchy, is rising. And it's not just an American thing. It's rising around the world. We see that there's left behind a great spiritual darkness. And this is one of the triggers it's the spiritual darkness, by the way, that will ultimately play the role in the signing of the seven-year peace treaty. But the fact of the matter is sanity. Can we agree on this? Sanity is evaporating from the earth right now. Sanity. Are you kidding me? I can't believe how many calls I got this week from Los Angeles County Deputy sheriffs and attorneys calling me. Pastor, will you pray for me? I cannot work under these conditions. We see what's going on. This new DA is driving anyone, everyone who is good and has integrity and wants to uphold the law. We're being, we're being marked if we believe in upholding the law and we are being overrun. You see what's going on? If you, it sounds like you don't know what's going on. You should find out what's going on. If San Francisco didn't teach us any lessons, and apparently it didn't, L.A. County hired as D.A. That is, well, L.A. the voters. This is, you know what, I got to tell you, I don't want to go down this road, but I'm telling you, he rightly said the voters, but I'm thinking more like Dominion might have hired, might have put him in. The guy's crazy. And he's evil. And he's saying, you know what? You get to get out of prison. You get to get out of prison. And oh, by the way, if this stuff's happening on the streets, do not arrest them. You leave them alone. What is that? So how does that fit in the Bible? Lawlessness. The love of evil. God is going to judge evil. Nobody gets away with this. People who are mocking and shaking their fist at God, God will have the last day. People think they're getting away with stuff. God is going to take care of it. He's the judge, and he's going to set it straight. Nobody gets away with it. We may not see it in this world, but it's certainly on the day of judgment. The wicked will stand before him, and the Bible says he will slay the wicked with his wrath and with his righteousness. It's coming. God will respond to great spiritual darkness. There is also left behind the beginning of judgments. After the rapture and the tribulation period begins, the Antichrist is in the world. Israel is isolated from the nations of the earth. Prior to the great seal, trumpet, and bold judgments that are found beginning in the book of Revelation chapter 6, we are already now seeing globally the beginning of judgments. And these aren't even written in the Bible yet. They're just general. Call them general judgments. 
The Bible tells us, this is unnerving, that Satan is the prince and the power of the air of this age. This may startle you if you don't know your Bible, but the Bible says that Satan, Lucifer, is the god of this world. His time is running out and he knows it. That's why the greatest thing you and I can do right now is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. More than ever. Don't let COVID and fear and torment win the day. Use those moments to tell your friends the gospel. People are, families are being torn apart, by the way. Why? Sanity is being lifted from the earth. And people are adopting insanity. The Bible says, warning, we have made a covenant with hell and with death. We are in agreement. That's what happens when you're deceived. And we're living in a very deceptive age. Watch out for that. And then finally this, there is left behind the rise of imposters. There's an age of deception, no doubt coming, but you're going to see the imposter, that's the Antichrist, throughout Scripture, but there's the rise of the imposters. Yes, the Bible says that he will exalt himself, and he's going to do this, no doubt. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24. It's fascinating. You guys okay? We're almost done. In Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples just got done showing Jesus again the beauties of the temple. And they went and sat on the opposite side of the Temple Mount, on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Messiah, Christ, and will deceive many. When somebody says there's a lot of roads to heaven, they're of the Antichrist spirit of deception. When somebody says Jesus is not the Messiah, the Bible says they are of the Antichrist, the spirit of deception. Watch out. There's imposters everywhere. Don't think that they only live behind a pulpit or some uh, cathedral or chapel or some institution. They're certainly there. But Satan has got his imposters everywhere. In 1 John 2.18, the Bible tells us, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. Wow. The message of imposters. Jesus said false Christs and false messiahs will rise. They're coming. And they will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. I'm going to give you six things. They're going to be really fast. Number one, do you think you're allowing yourself to be deceived? Look at your life. What do you allow in? What do you listen? Who are you reading? What are you reading? Is there some an open door there in your life? Number two, what are you reading? What are you studying? What's, what's shaping your view? This is a big one. You ask, quote, the man on the street today, hey, what do you think about? And it's, it's ridiculous. So how are you being informed? Thirdly, what are you listening to? What are you listening to? Four, where did you get that information? Well, I read on the internet. I got it online. I think this is a good practice to adopt. Uh, if it's not in the Bible, you should at least doubt it. If it's, listen, if it's not in the Bible, you should at least adopt I doubt it kind of an attitude. One plus one equals two. That's not in the Bible. Let's make sure here in California, it still equals two. <laughs> right? Because we don't know for sure. Let's end. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. No, thanks. I got to really... Uh, so first service was practice today for second and third service.
Doesn't your personal bias shape what you think, your worldview, how you conclude things? It's true, you know. Yesterday I was getting out of my truck, going into a store, and I heard a bunch of horns honking, and there were people driving down the street. It was a caravan, and they had American flags and Trump flags. And, well, listen, listen, and these women behind me who got out of their car, they said, what is that noise? I could hear them. What is that noise? What is that noise? What are they doing? Listen, why are they doing this when it's over? Listen, when it's over, the, the, the election is over. Why are they doing that? And think about that. Where, where do they get their information? Because a lot of people today think it's over. They have no idea what's happening in the courts and what's happening in the states because they're not, they're not studying it for themselves. And that's just that area. What about Jesus is coming back? Oh, I read somewhere that that's not going to happen. I don't know. I, so I read somewhere. And then finally this. Guys, uh, there's a couple of slides, these pictures. Um, this, I was at Barnes & Noble the other day because it's that time of the year. Right? It's Christmas. So look to the left. The light of the world, his message of hope for the future. That's pretty cool. I don't know what they mean by that, but that's cool. The middle one, National Geographic, Jesus and the origins of Christianity. Could be good, could be bad. Right. Don't know. They'll sell millions of these. And people will form their theology about Jesus from the University of National Geographic. And then Life Magazine, watch out, Life Magazine. Jesus, who do you say that I am? I didn't even open it up because I'm afraid to find out what li how Life Magazine is going to answer that question. I think there's a, watch this, next slide, I think, right? Next slide. That's, okay, we just saw that one. Let's move ahead. This is the great one. The unknown Jesus. The real story of the Messiah. Wait, wait, do you see it? Everybody, I need you. We're going to end. You can stand even. Go ahead, stand up. Take a look at the screen. Go ahead. I want you to get some air in your lungs. Have we become so dumb that we don't recognize deception when we see it? This is deception. And I'm wondering if you, did, if you see it, if you care. Look, the unknown Jesus, excuse me, that just blasphemed the Bible. That just blasphemed the God of heaven and earth. That tells me Jesus is unknowable. We don't know nothing about him. He's the unknown Jesus. He can't be known. So buy our magazine. Why? bottom or mid-right hand section. We're going to tell you the real story of the Messiah. Deception. 100%. How many people even detect that? You cannot detect this? This is blatant. If you cannot detect it, you're in deep trouble. Father, today more than ever, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be upon our lives, and Lord, I pray this in, 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 a, in a bit of holy terror, because you said, Jesus, to those who have light, I'll give more light. To those who have light, but it's dark, what light they do have will be taken away from them. And that, I tremble at that. Because it is incumbent upon every man and woman, boy and girl in the Bible to know more of you and to know your revealed word. Because if we don't, our light could begin to diminish. Our lampstand begins to lose its flame. And our oil begins to run out, spiritually speaking. Dear God in heaven above, Please pour out your spirit upon this church. 
and make us ready for whatever you want to do next. Catch us on fire. And Lord, may we bring everything about us under the authority of the Bible. And then, Lord, wind us up and let us go. We thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ and our resurrected Savior. In his name we trust and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.